Hi everyone, I'm Kevin, a researcher from Google. And today I'm gonna to be presenting our new work on LoRa bounds for multi-server oblivious RAMs. This is a joint work with my fabulous colleagues from Aarhus University, Casper Green Larson and Mark Simkin. All right, let's get started. So today what we're gonna be focusing our thing on are things called privacy preserving storage protocols. So what does that mean? Uh, we're considering a setting, setting where on the left, you have a client and on the right, you have a server that you can imagine is holding some data. So in this case, we can imagine an array of N entries. So, you know, B1 is the first entry, B2 is the second entry, so on and so forth. And what's gonna happen is sort of the client will receive and want to query to retrieve the if index from the server held array. And, we'll, and maybe it'll do so in some privacy preserving way. So some, you know, very fancy or compl complex way such that it, in the end, it retrieves uh, the if entry, but it wants to do so in such a way that whatever the server sees, so for example, you know, the, the accesses that are occurring or whatever is stored in, in server memory, the server can't really tell what was the requested index. So what was I in this case? And to do this, there are, are a variety of different techniques that can be done, but at a high level, one of the main techniques, especially in this sort of area is, is the following where you can imagine the client is holding some sort of private key. And what it'll do is essentially encode the database in some way. So maybe it'll randomly shuffle, it'll encrypt the, uh, the entries in some way that's hidden that the, the, the server will not know the, the ordering or where entries are stored on the server. And of course, what happens is as queries occur, these things will change over time. And you know, the, the, the blocks will be reshuffled and re-encrypted over and over again. So in particular, what we're really gonna focus on is this primitive called oblivious RAM. So what is an oblivious RAM? What you can think of is taking an access pattern. What an oblivious RAM does is takes an access pattern and sort of obfuscates it in a way such that the serve, what the server sees are, are sort of, you know, the results of the oblivious RAM, whatever the, the oblivious RAM accesses or stores in memory, sort of, this is what we donate by ORAM as the access pattern. It sort of hid, it, it sort of hides what the original access pattern is. So what is this ORAM at the access pattern? It's essentially whatever the server sees. So this is, you know, whatever is stored in server memory, as well as whatever accesses to the encrypted memory are done by the client. And for privacy, what an oblivious RAM essentially says is that, let's say you take two sequence, two access patterns of the, of the same length, the resulting server's view created by the ORAM will be essentially indistinguishable. So what it means is the server cannot, disting cannot, learn, cannot distinguish any two access patterns of the same length. So what we're really gonna focus on is the multi-server variant of this case. So what you can imagine is now there are K servers, you know, let's say one, maybe labeled one to K left to right. And you know, each of them can store an encoded version of the database. But what's gonna happen is that the adversary will be able to compromise exactly one server. And I want to quickly caveat the fact that the, that sort of the, the user or the courier doesn't know which of the servers have been compromised. Otherwise, the problem is very straightforward and that you can retrieve an item from the server that's not compromised. All right, so sort of um, before we begin and dive into our results, I wanted to sort of outline two very simple ways of doing multi-server oblivious ramps. So trivial algorithm number one is sort of the following. You know, the, the user has an index i and wants to retrieve the if index. To do so, it'll just do a plain text query to a random server. So the, you know, the query doesn't know which of the servers are compromised. So instead it's gonna pick a random one and hope that, it's, that the one is chosen is not, is, not, is not compromised. So of course this has order one overhead, you just literally retrieve the, the entry. But what is the adversary's advantage? It's essentially one over K. You know, it's just the probability of what it, was the courier unlucky enough to have chosen the server that was compromised by the adversary. All right, so this is trivial algorithm one, and this seems a little, you know, it's weak. It doesn't really, you know, it's, it's essentially a naive sort of algorithm in terms of privacy. So let's go to the other extreme. What's another trivial algorithm for doing multi-server ORAM? Well, the, a very simple one, for example, would be to just use a single server ORAM query. You know, pick one server and always do a single server ORAM query. So this will have a logarithmic overhead. And, and, uh, essentially the best ORAMs have been proven and single servers have been proven to have to be tied to logarithmic overhead. And the adversary's advantage now becomes much smaller than one over K. In fact, it'll be negligible in some security parameter. It's more negligible in N typically. 
but sort of this seems wasteful in the sense that if you think about it deeper, if you're just doing a single server ORAM query, you're assuming actually the adversary has compromised every single server and it's sort of the worst case. We're not really utilizing sort of the power of only one of the servers being compromised and K minus one of them being sort of free and sort of whatever's happening is out of the view of the adversary. So, you know, if we, if we were able to guarantee that we always did a plain text query to a non-compromised server, we would actually get, get an ORAM essentially. So single server ORAMs seem to be very, they don't seem to utilize the power of the multi-server setting where K minus one servers are not compromised. All right, so given these two trivial algorithms, we, this actually leads us to our main result, which is actually a very strong lower bound. So in our, in our paper, what we essentially prove is that any multi-server ORAM with K servers, where the adversary compromises exactly one server, you know, that oblivious RAM must have logarithmic overhead when the distinguishing advantage is at most one over 4K. So what it's essentially saying is, is that, you know, we have this trivial algorithm. If you want it slightly less advantage, you know, just a factor of four less, you actually require logarithmic overhead. So what does this theorem sort of imply? The first sort of corollary is that multi-server ORAMs that require negligible advantage, advantage, you know, the typical privacy guarantees of an oblivious RAM, they actually require logarithmic overhead, even with a polynomial number of servers. So that's actually very strong. If I had a polynomial number of servers, it still doesn't help me get a better multi-server ORAM with better overhead. And sort of the second corollary is that the two tri trivial algorithms are actually optimal for their regimes of distinguishing advantage. So for example, if you're okay with the distinguishing advantage one over K, where K is the number of servers, just use this uh, sort of trivial algorithm where you pick a, a server uniformly at random and hope that it's not compromised by the adversary. And simultaneously, if you want anything less than one over K, so it's not like less than one over four K, a single server ORAM actually suffices to give you the optimal solution. And you can just ignore K minus one server, the K minus one servers, other servers. All right, so sort of uh, now for the rest of the talk, what I'm gonna go through is sort of outlining the proof of how we were able to prove this very strong theorem. So to prove, to, to show how I proved this lower, how we proved this lower bound, we start, we start off by telling you what the model is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna prove our lower bound in the cell probe model, which is used quite often for data structures and cryptographic data structures. So what happens again, we have the client on the left, the server on the right. And what we want to do, what we're gonna consider is the server memory is gonna be split up into something called cells. So each cell is the same size, what we're gonna call W bits. And we'll assume that each cell is, is uniquely addressed by some integer. And what happens is, in, so we have these cells and what we're gonna do is we call a probe. So let's say for example, when we say the client probes a server cell, what it essentially means is either reading and or writing to that specific memory cell. And in the cell probe model, that's the only cost. So, you know, probing or reading or writing to a cell, cell of W bits is the, essentially the only cost in the cell probe model. Everything else is free. So computation is free, random oracles are free, random misgeneration is free, excuse me, accessing client storage is free. And what I wanted to get, what I want to sort of emphasize is that by considering a very weak cost model, we actually end up with a very strong lower bound. So you can imagine any reasonable model that also charges computation, you know, randomness generation, client storage access. Well, we'll all, the lower bound will also hold in such a model. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna prove our lower bound using a technique called the information transfer technique. And this was introduced by Mihai Petrosky and Eric Demain in, you know, I think around in the mid 2000s. And it was recently used the last couple of years by Casper Larson and Jesper Nielsen to prove lower bounds in ORAM. And this was the first uh, sort of paper that connected the cell pro model to oblivious data structures in particular oblivious RAM. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be adapting the information transfer technique used in both of these papers to prove our, our multi-server oblivious RAM lower bound in the cell pro model. All right, so let's, so let's, let's just dive into the details now. So, it's called the information transfer technique and it's because of the, the underlying sort of structure that they have sort of virtually in the memory is something called the information transfer tree. So what this is, is a binary tree with essentially N nodes if you're considering N operations. And what you're gonna do essentially is uniquely assign each operation to a leaf node of the tree. So for example, if there's N operations, you can imagine that they're uniquely, uniquely uh, assigned going from the first operation all the way to the nth operation from top to, to bottom. So what is this operation we're talking about? An operation you can think of as a, as a virtual operation. So for example, reading to uh, an entry of an oblivious RAM, writing to an entry of an oblivious RAM. 
And what's actually happening in these operations is that they're underlied by some sort of cell probe, so cell reads and cell writes. So for example, the first operation is sort of underlined by a, a sequence of cell operations. So maybe it's reading to the 15th uh, cell on the third server, you know, where the sort of the superscript represents the, the server and we assume each server is unique identified by some integer. And, you know, and, and the argument is essentially the address of that cell on that server. So you essentially, these virtual ORAM operations are sort of implemented using a series of cell read and writes. So, okay, so given that we know what a virtual operation is, uh, is defined as, how, where does the information transfer tree come in? So what essentially we're gonna do is, for each of the operations, so for example, let's say the third operation had, a, had read cell 15 in the if server. For each of these cell reads, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back until we, and we're gonna go back in time. So, you know, the third operation, we're gonna go back to the second operation or maybe the first operation and find the last time that the cell, the 15 cell on the if server was written to. So for example, let's suppose it's the first operation. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, the two nodes that are associated with each of these operations, find the lowest common ancestor, and essentially assign this cell probe to that internal node. So here it's assigned to the, to the level, to the, to the sort of the internal node two levels above. All right, so, so why is this interesting? You know, this is, seems to be a very uh, arbitrary way of, of assigning cell probes to internal nodes. So what the, the key point that ends up, that, the, that's being used throughout all these papers is the following. So let's suppose, let's look at this, this internal node, the one colored red. What is essentially, what, what essentially the information transfer tree does is it characterizes the exact amount of information that can be transferred from operations of the top subtree rooted at the red node to the bottom subtree rooted at the red node. And essentially, what it's essentially saying is that whatever probes were assigned to this red node must be the totality of information that's being transferred from any operations that were written in the upper subtree of this uh, uh, rooted at the red node to the bottom subtree rooted at the red node. So at a high level, this doesn't, this, you know, maybe this doesn't make sense off the bat, but what you can later do is sort of try different, uh, different nodes to see that this is not true. So for example, if you considered either the left or uh, the top or bottom child of this red node, you'll see that the information here sort of uh, assigned, any, any probes assigned here actually can transfer information to the bottom subtree because if otherwise, if, if any cell writes that were, done, that were done here were read here, they would have also been assigned to the, to, the, to the red node. And vice versa, you can see that any probes assigned to any sort of parents of the red node, they were actually not read in, in, in the subtree rooted at the red node. Instead, they were read in the outside of this, outside of the subtree rooted at the red node. So it's actually, what, what, what will eventually happen is if you think carefully, you'll actually see that the totality of information transferred from the top subtree root of the red node to the bottom subtree root of the red node, all that information must be contained essentially in the probes that are assigned to this red node, as well as any information that could be stored in the client storage. But for now, let's suppose that client storage is quite small and it's it not, it not significantly large. All right, so let's say, okay, so let's say, you know, you can take it for granted sort of I, what I've told you, or maybe later you go and in, you go into the details of our paper and find out what what I'm trying to tell you about this red node. So what I'm going to show you next is how to maximize the assigned probes to a node to an internal node. So if what, what I just said before in the last slide is true, how can we maximize the number of assigned nodes to this red to this red node, for example? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to maximally write as much information in the top subtree of the red node, and then subsequently read it in the bottom subtree of the red node. As a result, if truly all the information is sort of contained in the probes that are assigned to this red to this uh, red node, it must be that in this case the information is maximized because of every sort of operation in the top subtree is subsequently read in the bottom subtree. So if we're truly writing random sort of entries and then reading them afterwards, all that information must be stored in the probes that are assigned to this red node. All right. So now that we sort of have an idea of you know what does the assignment of probes mean and, uh, and sort of maximum, what does it mean to maximize a single internal node? This leads us sort of to our lower bound. So what's gonna happen is our lower bound is actually a very trivial sequence. It's just reading zero consecutively n times. All right, so then you might ask me right now saying, this, like, this sounds, you know, this is not hard to, hard to implement. In fact, if I wanted to read zeros, you know, if I'm only reading a single index, I can just always retrieve that index and that'll be oblivious. So isn't this operation like easy to handle? 
Um, the answer is it's not. And the key idea is that the sequence must be indistinguishable from all other possible sequences of the same length. So for example, I shouldn't know if I'm reading only zeros, if I'm reading only one, if I'm reading only two, so on and so forth. So it really, the key idea is that even though this hard sequence is not very hard, in fact, every specific sequence might not be so difficult. It just so happens that hiding which of hiding them from each other ends up being very difficult. And you can sort of take the worst parts of each sequence. So, all right, that might seem very vague. So let's go right into sort of the ideas of how to do the proof. All right, let's suppose, you know, this is a very trivial sort of, uh, you know, I've taken the hard sequence and I've just put them into the information transfer tree. All right, well, let's take this idea. Okay, my key idea, the key idea is sort of, you need to sort of be indistinguishable from other sequences. Okay, so let's let's try this. Well, I'll I'll change every other uh, you know every other operation to a right to zero. Well, actually, okay, if we take a look at this carefully, what we're actually doing is if each of these writes are truly writing random bits to the zeroth entry and then subsequently reading them, what we're actually doing is maximizing the information transfer for all of these red nodes on the of the parents just above the leaf. Okay, so that seems interesting. So let's let's do this again. Could we do it for the other turn nodes? Well. Again, if we sort of did, you know, write zero, write one, read zero, read one in the first four operations, this subsequently maximizes the information transfer for this red node. And of course, I can do it again, sort of for the bottom subtree and get and maximize that the other red node at that at the same level. You know, just to just to make sure everyone is clear, you can sort of do this one more time as well and sort of even maximize the roots by sort of doing four writes subsequently sub, uh, four writes of random entries with subsequently four reads. Okay, so let's let's take these ideas and, and actually complete the lower bound. So what actually happens in a single server lower bound is this this actually suffice to sort of prove the lower bound. So by security, the number of probes assigned to each internal node cannot differ too much from sequences that maximize the assigned maximize the assigned probes. So for example, the reason for you know there for each node there exists some sort of sequence that maxim that maximizes um, the assigned probes to that uh, node just for correctness, just to be able to, to correctly return the answer. And you know, just by security, if, for example, you see that a specific node doesn't have something close to that maximum, you can sort of rule out with high probability that it was this specific hard sequence for that internal node that was executed by, by the challenger in the, in the security game. And it turns out by just by summing the maximum number of probes assigned over all nodes, you get the, you, it provides a lower bound of n log n. So you know, we had n operations. If you sum up the, the maximum number of probes assigned over all nodes, you'll end up getting n log n. All right, but the problem for the multi-server case is that actually this sort of first security argument, it doesn't really go through. So, so let's see sort of why. Um, so, okay, we have this information transfer tree. You know, I've just given sort of random numbers. So, you know, I'm telling you 16 uh, probes have been assigned to the roots and, you know, subsequent so forth. For his, for his top child, seven probes were assigned and his bottom child, nine probes were assigned. But if you think about it carefully, when I described the information transfer tree earlier, it was really actually the probes across all of the servers, right? So actually the 16 is the sum of all the assigned probes from across all of the K servers potentially. So let's say we take a two server example. So what does the adversary sort of really see? It doesn't see this information transfer tree. What it really sees is, you know, depending on which of the two servers the adversary had compromised, if it, for example, compromised server one, it would see something like this, you know? where you know it's it's sort of you know a subset of the of the assigned probes to the, in, in the original information information transfer tree and subsequently if you had if the adversary had a compromised server two you might have seen something different and so we can see right away that since the adversary doesn't see both the servers it can't really sort of automatically get that each internal node must be maximized must must be close to the maximum number of assigned probes all right, so then how do we sort of get around this? Well, the answer is sort of in the following way. So we're gonna use two facts, which actually I've, I've already explained before in some ways. The first fact is that the sum of assigned probes to each internal node over all service views must be large. And this is for the specific hard distribution for that node. So we know there exists some hard distribution for a specific node that maximizes the number of assigned probes across all servers just for correctness, just to be able to return the correct answer. So even if you split this up across multiple servers, just for correctness, I know that the sum of these assigned probes across all the servers must still be large. And the second thing is sort of just, it's, it's I mean, it's sort of obvious, but 
in a sense, what we're trying to say is that each server's view cannot be significantly different for each sequence. So we know there's some maximal sequence that would, with high probability, take the sum over, uh, the, maximize the sum over across all of the servers. Well, it can't be that an individual server's view can differ significantly for any sequence, even if it's not hard for that specific node. So the best way I like to view this is sort of as a PDF. So what I'm saying is, so what I was trying to say is, you know, we can imagine this probably density function where you have the densities and sort of, you know, we're, we're looking at a specific node here and that node's hard distribution, the one that should maximize the number of assigned probes summed across all the servers. So what, I'm, what happens here is, you know, the, the y-axis sort of the density, the probability of seeing this number of probes assigned for a specific server. And then, you know, we can maybe see sort of the number of probes assigned, maybe this, this range from zero to 15. So, okay, from the first fact, we know that, for example, this PDF shouldn't be zero. There must be, you know, for, if I pick a random server, since I know that the sum across all servers must be large, it must be that some of the, the, the many of these servers have a, have a, a non-zero, like they don't, they're not, they're not assigning, you know, they don't have, they're not always having zero probes assigned for this specific node. So it must be that this sort of PDF is sort of skewed at least to the right and that there must be a non-zero number of probes assigned, quite a bit of number of assigned probes on average across all the servers. So what we actually do is we sort of take that PDF and convert it to something that we can actually sort of use as an adversary. So what we do is we sort of group them into exponentially growing sort of uh, into exponentially growing uh, groups. So for example, we do is the very first group we, we assign from zero to one probes. The second group we assign from one to two probes. You know, the, the left side is inclusive, the, the right side is exclusive. Then, the, then you grow to a, a group of size from two to four, then four to eight, eight to 16 and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's exponentially, the group sizes are sort of growing exponentially. And what I'm gonna do is I just took the PDF over all, all the possible assigned, assigned probes in each of these ranges. So what I did is I took from this previous thing I just combine them into a, into sort of this PDF where the, the you know the densities are summed up over each of the ranges. And at a high level, all of the what we're going to do is the following: the adversary will essentially just just check. So, for example, it'll say, "Okay, I know for this specific uh, distribution for the for the hard nodes hard distribution, and for this specific server, the adversary knows that okay, well, for example, you know, seeing a number of probes assigned." between eight to 16 is at least 40%. So what actually happens is that the PDF of assigned probes for, for, for the hard distribution, you know, the original hard distribution where it's reading only the zeros, it really has to be within range. It can't be too different. Otherwise, as an adversary for this specific server, you know, I, I might pick the server with probability one over K. If truly one of these, these uh, you know, these densities was significantly different, I can actually detect that difference as a PPT adversary. And in, in fact, when I were to get maybe the, if I were to able to, you know, I can, I can submit a challenge where I have either the, the nodes hard distribution or the true hard distribution for the lower bound, which is reading all zeros. And I can try to just guess, you know, pick one of these ranges where the probability densities have changed significantly and sort of just, just guess between them. And I'd, and I'd be correct with non, with, with the significant probability. And essentially just by this reasoning alone for the PPT adversary, you can prove the, essentially that the PDF for the, for the for signed hard distribution can't be really different than the nodes hard distribution. And we can also prove that this is very large just by the fact of, like I said before, for correctness, you know, this nodes hard distribution just to be correct on the answers requires you to have that the, the expected sum across all the servers is large. And that means that even for this hard distribution, that's really trivial, you know, reading z the zeroth entry n times, it must still have a large number of uh, probes assigned. And in fact, once you sort of have this intuition, the rest of the proof is actually complete in a sense in that you can show that essentially by sort of using these range, by sort of using these ranges, you know, okay, maybe in this case you have, you know, the, 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 maybe in the nodes hard distribution, you might actually assign 15 very often or, or, or 14 very often. And maybe in this PDF, it might only assign eight very often, but this is only a factor of true loss. And by the way, we've done this sort of exponential range sort of grouping. We ensure that from the from the single server lower bound to the multi-server lower bound, we only lose a factor of two essentially. And this is in you know, factor of two is very small in the lower bound, so we still get a lot of the lower bound. And that actually completes the proof for 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 our lower bound. Um, I mean the rest of it's sort of putting it all together and putting the math together, but that's more technical. And this is sort of the high level main idea of how to construct the adversary. All right, so I mean that's actually the end of the the end of the lower bound. Uh, 
proof and essentially the end of this this, this, this presentation. And before I wanted to go, I wanted to present some other cryptographic self of lower bounds that exist. So in particular, I wanted to shed light on other work that has been done in this area. So for example, like I said, the earliest, the first work was by Larson and Nielsen proving a logarithmic, a tight logarithmic oblivious RAM lower bound. Shortly afterwards, Jacob and all in 2019 at Soda, they proved lower bounds for other oblivious data structures. So things like stacks, queues, deeks. Um, similarly, oh, oh, there was work at Eurocrypt in 2019 that showed an omega log and lower bound for a slightly weaker kind, kind of primitive called differentially private RAMs. Uh, the first sort of super logarithmic cryptographic cell lower bound where the, the non-cryptographic version was still logarithmic was done for oblivious new neighbor search at Soda 2019. And similarly at crypto this year, there was a paper by actually, you know, by myself as, as well as the yeah, Pino Persiano where we showed a logarithmic lower bound for other, for even weaker primitives such as encrypted search and things called encrypted multi-map. And also like to note that there's other works where they consider the cell pro lower bounds with other settings. So for example, ones where the adversary doesn't know the query boundary. So in our work, we assume that the adversary knows when one query ends and another query begins. But this paper by Hubachek and all at the TCC 2019 showed that even if the adversary doesn't know when queries start and end, you can still prove a logarithmic lower bound. So I hope you enjoy the talk and I thank you for listening in. And, I, and if you have any questions, I guess I'll be fielding them during the actual TCC live session. Uh, thanks again.